Hello everybody, this is Ben Teske from the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters and the Bring Back the Salmon program. There used to be a lot of Atlantic salmon out in Lake Ontario. And due to human activities by the late 1800s, they were all gone. And this program is about restoring this species, this very important species, back to Lake Ontario. This presentation will talk about the fish itself, about why we're doing this program, and what this program looks like. Atlantic salmon is one of 66 species of fish in the salmon family. Its scientific name is Salmo salar. Now, if you're not familiar with scientific names, scientific names are a way that scientists can categorize animals that are related to each other. And all organisms have both common names and scientific names. So for instance, a lion is Panthera leo, a tiger is Panthera tigris. They're both Panthera, they're both large cats that are related to each other, but they're separate species. For Atlantic salmon, their scientific name is Salmo salar, with roughly, which roughly translates to the leaping salmon. It got this name because this fish can jump up to three meters high. That's almost the height of a basketball net. And they do this because when they migrate to spawn, which is their journey to reproduce, they swim from large bodies of water like a lake or the ocean, and they swim against the current up river. And some of these rivers are really powerful. You see in this picture here, these fish are coming up to a big rapid and they're able to jump their way up that rapid and against that really powerful water. This fish can get quite large, the largest on record, was 1.7 meters and they do this really fascinating process called imprinting where they'll really get to know the particular stream that they grow up in they get a little bit bigger a little bit older they swim out to that big body body of water the lake or the ocean and then when it's time to spawn they'll turn around and they'll find their way back to the exact same place that they grew up in and this is a fascinating process some of these fish would have traveled thousands of kilometers and then it's time to spawn and they turn around and they find their way back to that exact same place. They do this by using electromagnetic fields and a very highly developed sense of smell. Their sense of smell is a thousand times more powerful than a dog's. So they can smell the particular chemical makeup of the place that they came from. They don't die after spawning, which you might not think much of, but for a salmon, that's significant. A lot of the species of salmon will only reproduce one time. They spawn one time and then they die immediately after that. Atlantic salmon will spawn multiple times. Here's a series of photos that just illustrates the power of this fish. This Atlantic salmon's come up to a small waterfall and it's launching itself right up out of the water and landing in that really powerful current and it's able to muscle its way upstream from that. The upper photos in this slide show just how big this fish can get. The upper right is of a male, it's in a stream and the male has changed colors a little bit and this is for spawning. It's also developed a hook on the lower jaw. We call that hook a kipe. And that kipe is developed so that the, this fish can do battle with other males over spawning territory. The lower right is of a carving of an Atlantic salmon that's in Scotland, and this carving is 2,500 years old. The one in the lower left is a carving that's in a cave in France, and this has been dated to 25,000 years old. And these two carvings just illustrate the importance that this fish has had to cultures that have lived in the same region that this fish has. And this is where we can find Atlantic salmon. This is the native range map for Atlantic salmon. So it shows how far north, how far south, how far east, how far west we're going to find this species. The colored area is the range of Atlantic salmon. If you look on the left hand side, you'll see the coast of North America. There's Labrador, 
there's Newfoundland there. Then up in here, we've got Greenland, there's Iceland, and on the right-hand side, we have Europe. So this is where we'll find Atlantic salmon. There's two different colors of yellow here. The lighter one is just indicating areas that we're not sure on the status of the populations there. The red is indicating extirpated populations. And you'll notice that when we go over here, you'll see the Great Lakes that are just circled there. And there's a red lake. And of course, this one here is Lake Ontario. That's the one that's relative to us. And extirpated means locally extinct. So you might be familiar with the term extinction, species that have existed before that don't exist now. Think about the dinosaur, the mammoth, the saber-toothed tiger. They used to live on Earth, and there's none now. Extirpated means locally extinct. The population has become extinct. So there used to be Atlantic salmon in Lake Ontario, and now they're extinct, but the species as a whole still exists in other parts of the world. This map shows more of a local geography. This is the Great Lakes, but it's of 12,000 years ago. 12,000 years ago, we were at the end of an ice age. So there had been a big sheet of ice that came across this landscape and shaped all the landforms that you see in this whole area of Southern Ontario. 12,000 years ago, that ice sheet was melting. It was melting back up to the north. And in doing so, it was flooding the Great Lakes. So you'll see where it says Lake Iroquois. That's basically a larger version of Lake Ontario. Now the Great Lakes currently will drain through the St. Lawrence River. The St. Lawrence River goes past Kingston, Montreal, Quebec City, and then out into the ocean. But 12,000 years ago, that ice sheet was blocking off the St. Lawrence River. So Atlantic salmon came up through the Hudson River and into Lake Iroquois. And Lake Iroquois met all of its needs. Atlantic salmon didn't have to go back out to the ocean. It survived in Lake Iroquois. Not only did they survive there, they thrived. Their population grew and grew and grew. And for thousands of years in Lake Iroquois and then Lake Ontario, that population was very large. Atlantic salmon didn't go further into the Great Lakes because of something that's right here between Lake, what says Lake Iroquois here and Lake Erie. So now it's between Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. Something that would block the movement of the fish. And that of course is Niagara Falls, much higher than three meters, much higher than a basketball net. So this was a natural barrier to the movement of this fish. This is the life cycle of the Atlantic salmon. The Atlantic salmon start out as eggs that the female lay in a gravel depression in cold freshwater streams. The male comes along and fertilizes these eggs, the female covers them back up with rocks, and then the parents leave. The eggs slowly start to develop. The first thing that we'll notice with the eggs are the eyes. So at this stage we call it eyed eggs. The eyed eggs continue to develop until a little fish hatches out. Attached to this fish is a little sack of yolk. So we call this stage of the fish's life alvin. has this yolk sack attached to its belly. If you think about a chicken, inside of a chicken egg, there is a yolk. And that's what the chick uses to grow. It's its food source. It's full of it's full of proteins, it's full of minerals and vitamins. And when that chick is done with the yolk, it's got to break itself out of the egg and it's, then it's got to start feeding. The alvin hatch out of the egg and they still have their yolk sac attached to them. And that's what they use for developing. So they just continue to hide in those rocks, the same rocks that the eggs were laid in. They hide down in those rocks and they're using that yolk sac for development and growth. And that's all they're doing at that point. 
to swim around like you would see a fish swimming around your your tank at home if you have a fish tank with goldfish or something like that if they were swimming around they would be using energy for movement when they want to be using all that energy for growth and development in nature it's really important and a really important law is the conservation of energy also swimming around would expose them to predators there's a lot of things that would want to eat these little fish so they stay hidden in the rocks until that yolk sac is completely gone at which stage they become fry and fry will start swimming around looking for food to eat in the fall they'll become par we call them par at this stage because of the marks on their side they're par marks and those marks are kind of like the stripes on a tiger or the spots on a baby deer. This is for camouflage against the gravel, the bottom of the stream. Just breaks up their pattern, they're not as noticeable anymore. One to three years in the stream, the fish will then smolt. The par will become smolt. So they change color again and they change color because they're headed for the big water. So for fish that are ocean run, they're going out to the ocean. For our fish here in Ontario, they would be going out to Lake Ontario. So they're more of a silvery color to blend into that big water. One to three years in the big water, then it's time for the fish to return as adults to that same place to spawn again. So they swim upstream into that cold, find that cold water stream and make another red. Now something that's really important about this life cycle is that there's two very distinct ecosystems, two very distinct habitats that these fish depend on. Cold water streams and big water, in our case, Lake Ontario. If one of these ecosystems is not healthy enough or doesn't meet the needs of the fish, then their success is gonna be compromised. They're not gonna be as successful. They might not even survive. It's also really important that these two ecosystems, these two habitats are connected. There needs to be connection from the stream to the lake and from the lake to the stream. For instance, if an adult out in the lake goes to return to its spawning ground upstream and there's a barrier to its movement, to its migration, and it can't get to that spawning ground then the life cycle is broken. There won't be any new eggs. There won't be any new alvin. There won't be any new par. There won't be any new adults. So we need to have both of those ecosystems be healthy, and we need to have connection between those two ecosystems. This is very important for this fish. The diet of the Atlantic salmon in streams, they start out eating tiny, tiny little bugs that you can, can't even see with your bare eyes. And then as the fish gets bigger, it eats larger and larger invertebrates, so bugs and worms. In the lake, their diet consists mainly of fish. You see in the lower right there, there's a sculpin and how much that fish is camouflaged into its environment. When Atlantic salmon was in Lake Ontario, it was the greatest freshwater population in the world. It was the largest freshwater population anywhere at that time. They used 40 streams around Lake Ontario. And this fish was very important to First Nation peoples in this area for thousands of years. It was a very important food source for those people. Atlantic salmon were also a very important food source for pioneers that were immigrating here from Europe. Starting in the 1600s through the 1700s and 1800s, a lot of people were moving over from Europe and they were also depending on Atlantic salmon as part of their food source and they found lots of fish here. In fact, with those pioneers, we also start to have written accounts of how much wildlife they were finding in Southern Ontario, including how much Atlantic salmon they were finding. In 1832, a person wrote in their journal that on the Credit River, two people in a canoe with a spear and a torch, 
so a stick with a fire on the top of it, they could kill eight to 10 barrels of salmon in one night. Now to put that in context, one barrel is about 200 pounds of fish. There were towns like Terracotta, which is up near Orangeville, used to be called Salmonville. Coburg, which is east of Toronto, used to be called Salmon City. And that was in reference to the Atlantic salmon. There were so many Atlantic salmon in those waterways that they named those places after Atlantic salmon. People wanted this fishery in other parts of the world. So eggs, in the 1800s, eggs were being sent from the Lake Ontario region to other parts of the world, such as New Zealand and Argentina. And it wasn't a massive amount of eggs. This isn't why we lost this species. It was just that they wanted this fisheries in those in this those parts of the world. So we now know that that's not a good idea. Moving species from one place to a place that they're not native to is not a good ecological practice. It can have a lot of ecological consequences. Uh, for instance, with invasive species, which are species that are not native to an area, that are moved to a new area, and they can displace the native biodiversity, the variety of life that's found there. So it can impact the populations of native, native plants and animals. In fact, this can lead to the extinction of species, and it does lead to the extinction of species. So we now know that that's not a good idea. But in the 1800s, they didn't know that, and they were doing this a lot. By the late 1700s, people noticed that the population of Atlantic salmon wasn't as high as it used to be. And in as early as 1807, people were trying to protect Atlantic salmon. And we had in Upper Canada, Canada wasn't even a country at that time, we had a law that was enacted to help protect Atlantic salmon. And that was one of the first fish and wildlife laws that we had in this land. Now, so people were trying to help Atlantic salmon through the 1800s, but by 1896, Atlantic salmon was gone. Now, what happened? Why did that happen? What kind of factors can you think of that may have contributed to the loss of this species? So the first reason was changes to the habitat. So the European settlers were coming in and they were changing the land, which was changing the water. If you look at this picture here, this is a perfect, fresh, cold water stream. This is perfect for the Atlantic salmon to spawn in and for the young fish to spend their first parts of their life in. It's got a rocky bottom. So it's places that the eggs can be hidden away and the little fish can hide, as well as those rocks are also really important for the food source that those little fish depend on. Those little invertebrates, the bugs and the worms, also use this rocky bottom. This is also cold. What do you think is helping to keep this cold? The trees. The trees are shading this area. If we remove the trees, the sunlight hits this water and it warms up. The trees also help to stabilize the bank. The bank is where the land meets the water. And this is a really important area for the health of the stream. The roots of the trees get into that soil and it helps to hold the soil together. You remove the trees, the soil crumbles more into the water. There ends up being more soil in the water, which covers up that, those rocks and makes it muddy. Without the trees, the sun's hitting the water and it's warming up. This was happening all over Southern Ontario. People were cutting down trees to make farm fields for villages, for towns, for cities, for building supplies. And a lot of the forest cover was lost in Southern Ontario through the 1700s and 1800s and even into the 1900s. So this change to habitat what made it so that the ecosystem, that habitat, wasn't as good for Atlantic salmon. Their survival rate would not be as high. 
And you can see here, really good habitat next to not as good habitat. Sunlight on the water and soil erosion. Next was increased barriers to fish migration. So we have on the right there, we have a mill. This one in particular is a corn mill. And you can see that there's a, a bit of a trough just outside that building. So what happens is water goes through that trough and it pours over that wheel. And that turns the wheel and that mechanical action of the turning of the wheel, that work could be used to do things like take a log and mill it into lumber or take grains like corn and wheat and grind them up. It could also be used to make textiles. But to get that falling action of water, they had to build a dam. So a dam is essentially a wall in the water. Now remember, the two ecosystems that the fish depend on, the cold water stream and the big water, they need to be connected. So this was a separation. It broke the connectivity of those two habitats. If it's more than three meters, there's no Atlantic salmon getting over it. And even if it's only a meter high, there's some fish that aren't gonna be able to get over that. This also would cause, if you see on the left, a pond in behind the dam. And with that, what that would do is it would impact the temperature. So how would that impact the temperature? Well, this water is now exposed to sunlight. It's also been slowed down more, so it's not running through the system quicker. It has more time to warm up. And it's also stopping the flow of soil in the water down to the lake. So not only is this dam impacting the access of the fish to really good habitat for spawning, it's also impacting the water downstream. The water's warmer, it's not as good for the fish anymore. Here's an example of a barrier that is an old, it's an old mill dam and it's much too high for fish to get from the lake up into really great prime habitat uh, that is above this dam and the fish can't get up past it unless people like this in this picture these guys are doing a fish lift so they're netting fish and then walking them up to the top and releasing them and that way fish that migrate from the lake into the upper streams into this cold water stream are able to spawn up there and it's producing those fish. Without these people here, those fish that migrate would not be present up in the upper part of this stream. Third reason is overfishing. So of course, if people take more fish than are being produced, then the fish population is gonna continually go down. The fourth reason was pollution. So back in the 17 and 1800s, most of the pollution that would have been entering the water would have been uh, biological. So for instance, you can see on the left here, cattle going into the water. So there would be a lot of um, manure that would end up into the water, either washing from the land into it or being deposited right into it. And this is somewhat natural for wildlife course they'll that their feces will end up in the water but when you have a concentrated population of domesticated animals there's just more manure being added to the water impacting the water quality and as we move forward in time more chemical pollution was being added into the streams as well as into the lake environment So we lost Atlantic salmon, but there were also more ecological consequences that happened. So for instance, sea lamprey, its population exploded with not having Atlantic salmon as a predator that was helping to control them. So sea lamprey is a type of fish, it's a jawless fish, and it attaches itself to 
other fish in the water and sucks the blood of of that fish and it can and it can cause quite a high mortality so without atlantic salmon that also impacted other large fish out in the lake so lake trout being another one and it was impacted more by this big population of sea lamprey and lake trout ended up disappearing as a result of that from lake ontario so that combined the loss of lake trout and the loss of atlantic salmon meant that the prey fish for these fish they had no checks and balances on them anymore so that caused an explosion of the prey fish and their population exploded but then they eat all the food that they depend on and diseases move in so there'd be this big boom of prey fish population and then there would be a collapse and all along the shores of lake ontario these prey fish were dying and washing up on the shore like piles of them sometimes knee deep all along the waterway so the loss of this apex predator this top predator of atlantic salmon had these other ecological consequences so again atlantic salmon became extirpated due to changes to the habitat increased barriers to fish migration overfishing and pollution and all of these are human impacts so humans can cause a lot of negative impacts the actions of humans can cause a little lot of uh, negative impacts to the environment but that doesn't have to be our only story we can also do good things and that's what bring back the salmon is all about it's a program to right the wrongs of negative impacts caused by humans now we're going to have positive impacts and that's what environmental stewardship is about it's about caretaking for the world around us this program has four pillars so we apply these four pillars to different waterways around lake ontario our main ones are coburg in the east and Duffins, which runs through Pickering, the Humber River, and the Credit River. And we also do some work on Bronte, which runs through Burlington. We also do some work on uh, Ganaraska, which is in Port Hope. It's not shown on this map. So we have four restoration program pillars that we're working on through this program. The first pillar of the program is fish production and stocking growing fish and releasing them so remember we didn't have atlantic salmon out in lake ontario just to help their population recover we have to produce these fish they were extirpated from lake ontario but they're not extinct as a species so we got strains from other locations which we then are bringing over to lake ontario and growing those fish for release so for instance um, right now what we're using is fish that originated their ancestral li lineage originated from Sebago Lake in Maine so that's northeast United States it's a landlocked population it's in it's in a lake it's a freshwater population and then we also use fish from the Le Havre River in Nova Scotia and if you are participating in a classroom hatchery that's where your fish that's the ancestral lineage of your fish and then we have adults that are in a hatchery so they're kept in the hatchery they're grown in the hatchery and that's where the eggs are are from so in this picture you can see the eggs are being extracted from a female this female has been sedated this this action has to happen quite quickly because of course the fish is out of the water so we want to get those eggs out and get that fish back in to its tub because that fish continues it's not injured in this process and it is used year after year for getting eggs so the eggs are are collected from the fish and then they're counted but they're not counted individually 
there's a process of math where we can see how many eggs will displace a certain amount of water and then that formula can be applied to larger containers and we can figure out roughly how many eggs we've got in a, in a much larger container. So if you see in the lower left there, there's about 5,000 eggs will come from one particular female fish. And in the hatchery in Harwood, which is on the south side of Rice Lake, which is south of Peterborough, we'll have about three and a half million Atlantic salmon eggs each year. So the trays that were in the, the slide that was just before this, those are all trays like that uh, in this room. So fresh, cold, oxygenated water gets passed through all of these trays continually to keep the eggs healthy. And if again, if you're part of the classroom hatchery program, this is the room that your eggs came from when the day that they were delivered, the person who delivered them came to this place first and collected your 100 eggs for your classroom hatchery. Once we've produced the eggs, we need to get them out into the wild. And we do this at different ages of, of the fish. So we'll put eggs directly into streams. We do this in the winter time in February. And then we do spring fry stocking and those fry will come in trailers and from the trailer they're placed into bags with water and oxygen and then those bags are poured into the waterway and we work our way upstream so we're not walking on the fish that we just poured out and we distribute them in a way so that they're not densely placed into the stream they're separated out throughout it and we also stock, of course, the classroom hatchery uh, are also spring fry. They're a little bit smaller than the ones that you see in this picture. Then we do fall fingerling stocking. And these are, we call them fall fingerlings because they're about the length of a finger. We do yearling stocking. So these ones, again, are a little bit bigger. And you can see this is a... a perfect example of a par. You can see those par marks really well developed on there. They're a bit bigger and tougher. So these fish, and they can swim a lot better as well. So these fish will be actually just pumped out of the trailer through a hose. And we can put a lot of fish out in a small amount of time. And then those fish will distribute themselves as they see fit. And here you can see the fish coming out of the tube. And once the fish have got into the water, they'll find places to hide. The second pillar of our program is habitat restoration. If we were to release the fish into the same situation that they became extirpated in, they wouldn't be successful. So we need to use stewardship to bring the health of the ecosystems that the fish depend on back up again. So we do this through a number of different ways. We do garbage cleanups. We do a lot of tree planting, and this is a really important one. Through tree planting, we're going to add shade to the waterway again. We're going to help hold back some of the erosion along stream banks. We're also going to keep pollution that might be washing off of the land. It's going to help keep that pollution from getting into the water also creates a lot of habitat for other species. Lots of birds and mammals are going to use those trees. Uh, lots of insects will be in there as well. We'll also do some larger projects where we'll help stabilize banks. So if the bank keeps eroding, um, then we can go in and put woody debris and rocks in place to help hold the bank together long enough that the root systems of trees and shrubs can get a hold and start to hold that bank together. We put rocks back into the water. So a lot of rocks were removed for the building of fences and for churches and 
barn foundations and houses it was an easy place to get rocks out of so we'll put some rocks back in to add structure places for the fish to hide behind we'll remove barriers so in this this series of pictures you'll see up in the upper left there's a bridge that's at a golf course it's fallen into disrepair but it's also blocking the flow of water and the flow of fish so that was a, a good one to remove so that being removed adds that connectivity again and when water level is higher fish will be able to swim through that the cement that came from that bridge was also useful again to benefit other species so on the in the lower left there you'll see piles of rock there that were placed for hibernaculums for snakes and in the lower right denning sites for fox So the ponds, again, if it's a human-made pond, there are ponds that are natural as well, but for human-made ponds, water flowing into that pond is going to be cooler than water flowing out. That pond is warming up that water. And so if we can, we can take that pond offline. So in the upper right picture, you'll see the pond is off to the left, there's been a berm put in place and now the stream is flowing next to the pond and not going through that pond and then of course we will also put plant trees and shrubs you'll see we use a lot of volunteers for this and this is an important part i mean it, it allows us to do a lot more work but it also is really good for people to be involved in this kind of work it uh, really feels good when you're doing environmental stewardship. You're giving back to nature because nature provides everything for us. So to give back to nature, we're giving back to ourselves as well. The third pillar is education and outreach. So we want to let people know about the fish, uh, about Atlantic salmon and, and why we lost uh, Atlantic salmon so that we can learn from from that story and not keep repeating this again with other species uh, and also how people can be involved in helping this just as simple as being able to identify this fish if you're fishing and so that you know to follow the regulations properly is a really important element we also go to trade shows we have a program where people can adopt a fish and help to um, sponsor this program we have our classroom hatchery program where we have we have aquariums with a chiller and a water filter and an aerator placed into classrooms and the the class will get a hundred eggs that which they get to watch develop uh, and it's a really great program for kids to be able to see fish in their in their classroom uh, developing and get to learn all about this species so we have right now we have as of 2020 spring of 2020 we have uh, 86 locations right now most of them are schools but some are also libraries and community centers and nature centers where there are eggs that are developing into small alvin and then fry we do a presentation which is it's this presentation that they get uh, delivered in their classroom. And then in May or June, the, we'll, we'll go into the classroom and collect the fish and collect the students. And we go to a restoration stream. So a stream that we've done in environmental work on, environmental stewardship on. And then the, the students get to release the fish into the water. Our fourth pillar is research and monitoring. So of course we want to see how the fish are doing so in the upper left you'll see three people in the water and they are doing electrofishing so that's a backpack electrofishing unit where they are just shocking the water a little bit and that stuns the fish just momentarily it doesn't it doesn't hurt the fish um, but doing that they can collect the fish and then take them up on shore and we can identify 
the species that are present so we get a we get to look at all the different species that are there and how that changes over time sometimes in relation to restoration projects that we're doing as well as we can see how Atlantic salmon are doing if we've been releasing them at that site uh, we might even be able to see you know Atlantic salmon that have were stocked a year before that are still surviving so that we can see that they they're surviving through winter and and then we also can see what their health is like as well. We have other ways of collecting fish as well. The upper and lower left pictures here are of a corkscrew trap. The upper right, you can see the net stretches right across the reach of the stream and it's funneling the fish down into a box where they can be collected and the same kind of information can be gathered on shore again. In the lower right, we've got a fish that's been given a little tattoo, which that fish could be released again and we can see how our collection how effective our collection methods are as well as if we catch that fish again say a month later we can see how much that fish has grown and how far it has traveled so sometimes we can't remove a barrier we can't remove a dam it might be serving up a, a purpose like uh, it could be power generation or it could be flood control and so if we can't remove it sometimes what we can do is lessen its impact so if you were to think about a dam being like a wall so if there's a wall in the room that you're in right now if there's a another story above that and we want to go from the floor that we're on right now to that second story and we want to do that easily and every day how can we do that we might not be able to jump up that wall. So what can we do? Well, just like we do in buildings, we build staircases. So we can build for fish, we can build, we call it a fish ladder, but it's really a, a fish staircase, a series of small jumps, or even in this case, in the lower left here, an Atlantic salmon could swim right up that and get above that barrier. Because we have a fish ladder going through certain areas, it also presents an opportunity for some technology for observing these fish, another monitoring technique. So we have fish counter technology in the Credit River and in the Ganaraska River, where there's a fish counter that also has a motion sensing camera on it and will start to take video when fish come through. In the upper left, you'll see there's a bunch of fish swimming through. We have a number of different species of salmon. Now in this video, we have an Atlantic salmon coming through and that's really what we want to be seeing. When we see a fish swimming upstream, it, it's going to, for spawning. That's a big Chinook that swim in by it. Sometimes we get other species like this beaver that swims by and makes an appearance. And now we have people that are catching Atlantic salmon out in Lake Ontario and in the streams. It's really exciting that the population is now at a state that people are actually catching them. And these people are really important to us as well on a citizen science level because they're out there they're out there fishing and so by engaging this community they can help us with giving us information on what they're catching we've had adults that have been found 77 kilometers upstream from the lake um, that passed six dams on their own which is really exciting and in the lower right there that little fish there was our first confirmed naturally born Atlantic salmon through this program. And that's really exciting because ultimately that's where we want to get to. We want to get nature back to being healthy enough to be producing these fish all on their own. Thank you for watching this presentation and please visit bringbackthesalmon.ca for more information.